from the Maple View Animal Hospital Studios, this is the WHTC Morning News with Gary Stevens and Peg McNichol on 99.7, 1450 WHTC and WHTC.com. And we welcome you back to the WHTC Morning News for this Thursday, August 27th. Thursday mornings, we have a chance to talk about some of the things going on with Wash in Washington with five-term Republican House Representative Bill Heising of Zealand. He ch chats with us from his uh, base of operations in Zealand. Good morning, Bill. Hope all, all is well. Hey, we're doing all right, Gary. Uh, it's hey, hopefully you too. It's a busy week with school starting and colleges starting, so uh, lots of people are running around, I know. <laughs> it sounds good. Uh, how much have you been able to follow the Republican National Convention? Normally, if we didn't have the COVID-19 situation, you'd be in Charlotte for this yeah. convention, but you know, you're home right now. Yeah, uh, at home and, uh, and, and being able to do a few of those things, like get the kids ready for college and, and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, it's been interesting. I've had my kids asking to turn the convention on, and uh, we've been we've been sitting around as a family watching, and uh, it's it's been interesting. Obviously, the heightened uh, situation socially, and and, uh, and and with you know the heightened political rhetoric that's going on, they've been wanting to do that. We did a little of that with the Democrats, uh, but you know it, it's been interesting. You've seen basically uh, you know movie stars and musicians versus everyday real people getting up there. And uh, lobster man, a truck driver. Uh, well, in fact, my daughter uh, said last night, uh, this, uh, this was after, uh, uh, after the nun, Sister uh, uh, Dee Dee Byrne, who was a Lieutenant Colonel medical doctor, retired and then went to work for uh, uh, Little Workers of the Poor is her order. Um, she got done speaking and, and very passionately about uh, the pro-life cause. And uh, my 19-year-old daughter said, wait a minute, so the Republicans have her. The Democrats had Billie Eilish. Now, Billie, she's an 18-year-old pop star, uh, very pro-choice and very assured about where, where she's coming from. But those are the two people. That's kind of the contrast. You've got an 18-year-old music pop star, uh, and you've got a, a somewhat older retired Lieutenant Colonel Nunn uh, up there giving, giving their views of the world. Uh, you know, I know who I go with, and I think I know who a lot of other people go with too, including yeah. now my 19-year-old daughter who even sees it. Uh, yeah, it, it, um, you know, after all, you know, you're playing to your base, and that's what yeah. these conventions normally do. And try to get the independent voters, which unfortunately is starting to become an endangered species, Bill, I think. You know, I, I agree with that, but there, I thought there was a, there's been another interesting um, uh, take to this, right? You know, lots of discussion about diversity within the Republican Party. When you've got Burgess Owens, Jason Brewer, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Clarence Henderson, who was, uh, a, is still a leading figure within the uh, civil rights movement, being up there talking, not to mention Tim Scott, Madison Cawthorn, uh, who's, uh, who's 25 and, and, uh, and told a very compelling story about his, uh, his, his injury and about how being in a wheelchair and being a, uh, a paraplegic, he suddenly felt that, you know, uh, being lost in society. Um, you know, Nikki Haley, uh, David, uh, or I'm sorry, Daniel Cameron, who's uh, the attorney general in, in Kentucky. There's been a very strong and I think direct play right into the African American community, right into the minority community uh, with Hispanics as well. And I think that's kind of the interesting thing, uh, having been to a number of these uh, conventions and, and, and watched sort of the analysis of it, it was always, oh, it's just the party of the white rich people. That's not the case. And I, I've known that for years, but if maybe for the first time, really the Republican party is putting on display who the Republican Party really is. And, and I'm glad that we're doing that. Uh, and uh, like I said, they're, they're going in and making a direct play into those Catholic voters who are pro-life, a direct play into those African-American uh, thought leaders uh, who are saying, hey, you know what? Uh, just because of this color of my skin doesn't mean I have to vote a particular direction. Same thing in the Hispanic community. So uh, that, that, was, that was something that certainly has struck me. We're talking with Zealand Congressman Bill Heisinger. Um, 
I will say this, and I'm going to put this as a, uh, a, a, a for lack of a better <laughs> term, Bill, a disclaimer. Uh, you're a Republican and, you know, a, a male Caucasian. But yet uh, the message to a certain extent that the Republican Party could present this week about race relations can really be timely considering what happened uh, with Jacob Blake in Kenosha, some of the unrest, some of the actions now in the sports world in the wake of this. Uh, it, it's almost like a repeat to a certain extent of what we saw after Memorial Day with George Floyd in Minneapolis. And the Republican Party has a great opportunity to express that message. And do you get a sense that the Republican Party is seizing this opportunity? Oh, I think that is exactly uh, showing. You know, you look at Tim Scott. I retweeted Tim probably two or three times yesterday, and he had a whole series of tweets talking about his Justice Act, uh, which was is, is a real tangible step. And when Chuck Schumer had the opportunity to take up uh, Tim Scott's Justice Act, a bipartisan bill that could have had 20 amendments uh, uh, to it, um, he refused to do so. Why? Because they're looking for a wedge issue. They're looking for a wedge political issue, not for solving society's problems. And um, that, uh, you know, some very, very powerful, powerful voices. Kim Clack, who's, uh, who's a candidate uh, out of Baltimore, uh, you know, that, that her video of walking around her neighborhood has gotten millions and millions of views. Um, you know, we, Wesley Hunt down in Texas uh, you know, I mean, we've got we've got a number of those voices that are out there, uh, and they need to continue. We need to uh, we need to have this conversation, and <clears throat> and hey, I found something that I agree with Joe Biden on, <laughs> which is good. Uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll be positive on this. He rightly said yesterday, as did Vice President Pence last night. We all support everybody's constitutional right to go protest and have their voice be heard. What is inexcusable and not acceptable is the rioting and the burning and the looting. Um, that that simply is not uh, that simply cannot be a part of uh, of of the solution. And uh, I understand it is a very heightened time right now, and it's very careful that uh, we need to be careful as leaders as to having measured words. Um, and uh, there's, uh, you're seeing a lot, uh, a lot less, I think, intentionality in those measured words right now, and it's, uh, it's all, uh, it's all either emotional or, unfortunately, sometimes political. Let's talk about a couple of uh, topics. One, I want to hold off on because it's going to probably uh, uh, take a little while, but I do want to hit this other one, uh, and I will read from my wire service copy on this. Ending the federal payroll tax could stop payments of Social Security by 2023. That's a stark warning from Stephen Goss, the chief actuary of uh, Social Security. Well, again, I might have butchered that word. Um, uh, Goss responded to a request for an analysis by Senate Democrats involving President Trump's call to eliminate the payroll tax, which is the primary source of dedicated funding for Social Security. Mr. Trump has pledged to eliminate the payroll tax if he is reelected, but that would require action by Congress. Your thoughts about uh, Mr. Goss's remarks saying that if the payroll tax goes away, Funding for Social Security goes away by 2023. Uh, otherwise, it goes away by 2027. Uh, that, that's, that's what people are forgetting. <clears throat> we know there's a collision course that's happening already uh, with Social Security, uh, and we have a responsibility to go fix it, not play politics with it. Now, what the, what the payroll tax is, is that's that, that chunk of money, that 7 point whatever percent, so it's usually 7.4 percent that comes out of our personal paychecks that then mostly goes into, uh, in, into Social Security. The, uh, the employer pays the other side of that uh, for, for a total of 15%. So um, we know that there's this collision course. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the idea of suspending or eliminating that payroll tax for a period of time is to put immediate dollars into people's paychecks. It doesn't get shipped to Washington, D.C., doesn't go through a bureaucratic process, doesn't get a check cut back to, back to people. It's immediate. You see it uh, uh, right in your paycheck. So I, I still think that is a good way, if we're looking at a way to stimulate the economy uh, immediately, to do that. That doesn't mean that we don't have to fix 
the, uh, the issue of, uh, of Social Security and all these other uh, commissions. Um, so uh, maybe what it would do is it would actually force us to deal with this in a more timely manner. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly cautious about well, how we are doing this, but I think that this could work. Now, I will note one, one other thing. There's 30 of us on the Republican side who have teamed up with 30 Democrats. Uh, and we have come together, uh, and unfortunately, we can't come up with anything more original than the 30 by 30. Uh, but we have written our leadership, both in the House and in the Senate, uh, requesting that not just Social Security, but all of the other commissions, and I think there's, there's something like 23 of them, uh, that, uh, that there be a study done on the viability of them and what this means. And this is about making sure that not only seeing years, but a rail, you know, the federal railroad retirement and, and postal workers and things like that, that we know that there's insolvency in all these areas, that we actually get serious about studying that. And uh, that, was, uh, that was taken up in the Senate version. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get that included in the House version as of yet, uh, but we're going to continue to push that because this is the conversation to be having. All right, final thing, Bill, and uh, we do have a few moments, and, and that's why I wanted to hold off this next topic off until uh, uh, the, the last part of our conversation. Um, I'm going to phrase this as post office flap. You visited uh, yep. a, a facility in Grand Rapids, in downtown Grand Rapids, last Friday. State uh, U.S. Senator Gary Peters visited a facility in Kentwood on Monday. Different <laughs> facilities. Yep. But we, I, I played your, 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 your remarks that you had on Facebook after the Friday visit uh, uh, that was uh, sort of interesting in a, an angle that really hadn't been played up that much about uh, the post office situation, where the ballots would be going to, and you went to the place where they would be going to, and unfortunately, Senator Peters went to a place where they might not be going to, and we have different angles, and you caught a little flack because of that uh, 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 situation. Has the dust settled a little bit, Bill, on this, or yeah. is it still something that uh, is around? Yeah, no, it's, it's still around, and, and you're right. I went to the facility that, uh, that processes all of the letters and ballots. He went to the facility that processes uh, magazines, catalogs, and packages. Uh, that's where uh, that, uh, that television news report uh, initially uh, had come out of was that facility, that Patterson Avenue facility, which is in the second district, not where the uh, letters are getting sorted. Now there's another side issue uh, that is happening and these two things are getting conflated. Uh, the other side issue is that uh, a union rep then said that what I was told on Friday was inaccurate. And they, uh, some, someone, I'm not saying they, but someone within the post office uh, provided photos uh, to uh, to the local television station, showing quote evidence that uh, that uh, these machines had been taken out. So we've been asking for clarification. I've gotten this verbally uh, that uh, that they that the uh, the leaders at that facility. Uh, I met with three of them and toured with three of them. That they stand by their uh, their words that there was no equipment that's been removed in the last 30 days and that there has not been a diminished uh, capacity at all. 1.3 to 1.7 million letters per day uh, go through that facility. And they, uh, in fact, it was just late last night, they verbally confirmed that, uh, that, uh, that there is not a diminished capacity, there has not been equipment removed. Uh, uh, the uh, television station has photos of what they say are this, uh, this vital equipment sitting on a loading dock. Uh, the, uh, again, verbally have been told that that predates uh, any of that. And so we're waiting for written confirmation and we're trying to get to the bottom of that as well. But here, here's at the end of the day, uh, Gary, uh, when you're Nancy Pelosi and you, th you call somebody like me or the president a domestic enemy uh, and that uh, you, you've made the, the post office this wedge issue, it probably doesn't matter to you what the uh, what the even the local leadership says. You've got a predetermined set in your head of what uh, what is happening, and 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 the conversely, uh, you know, I'm looking for the truth here. I'm trying to figure out what what's going on. My big major concern is is there a diminished capacity when our college students that we were just talking about, when our college students who are out of state or not around home, when they're sending their ballot in, are they going to be able to do that? Uh, our seniors, uh, are they going to be able to do that? 
Uh, that's the real question that we all ought to be asking is making sure that there's a capacity to be able to do what the post office needs to do for November. And I'm going to go even further than that, Bill, and talk about something you and I have talked about in the past over the years that you've been in Congress is the fact that the post office is bleeding money yeah. and they're trying to cut down the expenses. Part of it maybe is because of uh, 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 some decisions made years before you got into Congress about uh, uh, handling uh, pensions and stuff like that. But still, the bottom line, the post office is bleeding money. We talked about this last week, Bill, is the fact that the timing of these actions may not be the best, but still the issue of, hey, the post office has been bleeding money. Why haven't anybody done anything about it until now? Now they're doing something about it, and you know, there's a hue and cry about this whole thing. Well, and, and, and a lot of the actions that they're taking uh, date back to the Obama administration. Over the last 10 years, 35,000 blue boxes, those mail drop boxes, uh, have been removed almost 12,000 of them under the Obama administration. They get redeployed, they get moved around because people's uh, patterns and, and the usage of the mail system is different now. Uh, uh, same thing with, uh, with decommissioning. You know, this, this uh, magazine sorter that was part of the, uh, uh, the uh, television uh, reporting had been on the, on the, on the block for a, a quite a while. In fact, my staff had been get, receiving briefings about the, uh, uh, the diminished capacity at Patterson Avenue in the second district um, uh, for, for packages and catalogs and magazines and that they were making, they were taking steps towards that. Um, so, you know, and, and here's what we do know. GAO says over the next 10 years, uh, without any changes, the post office is going to bleed $146 billion, $146 billion that it's going to lose over the next 10 years if we don't have reforms. Nancy Pelosi's $25 billion uh, bill that I went to Washington, D.C. and voted on on Saturday, this past Saturday, had zero reforms in it, zero. All it did was paper over the problems. And, uh, and, and continue to, to make sure that uh, you know, the union officials had their jobs. Uh, but that, that can't be our goal here. We've got to make sure that uh, for all of us as, uh, as uh, hardworking taxpayers, that our money is being respected and used properly. And uh, I think everybody realizes we have a short-term issue here uh, where there is plenty of uh, cash available and a $10 billion line of credit for uh, that under the CARES Act to the uh, post office to make sure that in the short term, we can get through November with no hiccups and, and no diminished capacity, but we still need to continue this conversation uh, at, at, a, at a bigger scale as to what needs to happen at the post office to actually make it function uh, without bleeding money the way that it is. He is Congressman Bill Heisinger that joins, he joins us Thursday mornings to talk about some of the issues of the day. Bill, as always, we appreciate the time you spent with us today and uh, your, your, your responses to our questions. And if all goes well, let's do this again next Thursday morning. Thank you, sir. Sounds good. Thanks, Gary. Talk to you soon. Thank you very much. That Zealand Congressman Bill Heisinger on Real News Now, 99.7 and 1450 WHDC.